Uh, I'll show you here in just a few minutes. Just a few okay, minutes. Sir. Thank Let you. me get the recording going because there's some people who did um, send me a note ahead of time. They're not going to be able to be here. Um, and uh, we've got some people who are having internet connectivity issues. So I'm going to make sure the recording is working. Uh, that takes a couple of seconds here. Please bear with me. Okay. It looks like that's working. So, um, like I said, we're going to start off with a few administration things and then we will get into the lesson for tonight, which is all about everybody's favorite topic, the research process. Yeah, everybody loves to do research. It's an exciting thing. But, I'll, but the way I'll explain this tonight, it'll make you feel so appreciative uh, for the for the uh, it, technological advances that we made in the past 20, 25 years. Once we get into that, I'll, I'll explain that a little more. Um, okay, let me share my screen and so we can go through the admin stuff because uh, I've gotten quite a few questions about, um, let's see, here we go. Let me click into English Composition 1 for the online version. And nope, that's not the right one. Student preview, so we can bring up the shell that you all see. Let that fire up. And, all right, here we go. All right, so essay number one, um, I am still working on uh, grading those. I, I have uh, about half of them done. All right, so please be patient with me. I've had a few people send me an email, hey, if I haven't seen my grade yet. Well, I have about 40 people, uh, 40 papers to go through, and I've done a pretty good job of getting through them this week along with the uh, uh, teaching the classes. So uh, you should see a grade populate in your inbox or your Blackboard, uh, if not tomorrow, no later than Saturday, okay? So uh, for those of you who are really proactive with your grade, um, really want to, to stay on top of it. Your, your essay will be graded uh, shortly. Uh, you should see that populate um, no later than Saturday. Okay. I forgot to change five. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk about that too. No worries. No worries. Um, just to give you a little bit of feedback so far. Yes, uh, I have noticed that there have been a few issues here and there with the essays um, in, in regards to font, uh, format, uh, even text size here and there. Um, so I want to, to take this opportunity to reassure everybody in the class that for the first essay, I use the first essay as a teaching tool, okay? I, I'm not going to, um, grade these things in a very anal and meticulous way and just start knocking points off because it's not absolutely perfect. I don't expect them to be perfect uh, within the first couple of assignments. Um, and that's why I use the first few to as a teaching tool uh, to give you a lot of feedback about one, your writing style, okay? to the format of the document. Did you follow the directions and make sure that the document is formatted correctly in regards to the, the margin uh, for the document, for the font size, for the font type, uh, the relevant information that needs to be at the header of that text and uh, or for that essay and et cetera. And then I give you a lot of uh, feedback about the content. How does that document flow from point A to point B? Do you take time to really prepare a strong thesis statement um, and really explain that thesis statement as specifically as possible? Or do you rush through and uh, keep it somewhat ambiguous and, and general? Also, in regards to the body of the paper, what kind of logical flow did you 
um, <coughs> use to structure that paper? Does subtopic number one kind of set the stage for subtopic number two and, and, and number one flow easily into number two? And then does subtopic number one and two in combination with each other flow in and support subtopic number three? Okay. And then how the combination of those three or more, depending on how long your paper is, do they all reinforce the specific or the specificity of the thesis statement that you're making? Okay. Um, again, those are the things I'm looking for. However, I'm not grading strictly in the first major assignment. For those, so for those of you who have expressed a lot of anxiety, which I've gotten several email about, oh my God, I know this paper is horrible. Uh, I forgot to do this and this and this. Relax, okay? This is, uh, I'm not going to bring the hammer down on you because it's not perfect. I don't expect it to be, okay? But what I am gonna do is use this as um, an opportunity to give you personal feedback regarding your style, the format, and your content, how it's laid out on the page, okay? Now, having said that, what I really want you to do is make the most of the feedback that I do provide you because I'm making a record of, for each student in the class, I'm making a record of the feedback that I have given you, okay? and especially the problem areas and then the guidance that I'm giving you within that feedback to help correct it. If I see those things come up again in future essays, then that's when it's gonna start counting against you, okay? So make sure that when you get your grade this week, you get the notification in your email inbox and in, within Blackboard that that essay has been graded, make sure you download the document that I'm providing back to you and really take note of all the feedback that I'm giving you, okay? Don't, you know, even just take out a clean sheet of paper and start making notes about every, every aspect of that email as far as guidance and feedback and suggestions for improvement that I'm giving you. Because I guarantee you, you don't do that, you're gonna make those same mistakes again in a future paper, and that's when I'm gonna start really counting all for it, okay? All right, do I have any questions um, up until this point about essay number one? Let me look at the chat window and see if anybody's got any, any questions. All right. So there are no questions. All right, so again, uh, make sure you check your inbox, make sure you check Blackboard, especially if you get a notification. For those of you who are using the Blackboard app, as soon as I put that grade in there and, and, and post the feedback, you should get an immediate notification in your Blackboard app that that, um, that feedback and grade is ready for review, okay? Uh, again, you know, at your leisure, take a look at it this weekend, but please, please, please don't assume just because you have a good grade that it's going to, that, that <laughs> I'm not, I'm going to use the same grading standards for essay number two, three, and four. That's not the case. Okay. Uh, heed the guidance, heed the warnings, heed the instruction that I'm giving you in your personal feedback. And um, if you have any questions about the feedback that I'm giving you and you need some, uh, some extra help or supplemental training, uh, please send me an email and I will do my best to work with you one-on-one, -on -one, okay? All right, so having said that, we want to go ahead and prepare for the next essay, which is coming up in 18 days, okay? This is essay number two, the literacy narrative, all right? For those of you who have uh, done your homework and you've kind of read ahead, you're going to see that this narrative is somewhat similar. Uh, do I have a question? Um, yes. What's the literacy narrative about? I'm about to tell you. <laughs> okay. I'm about to tell you. Um, so it's, it's this link right here. Uh, you will, when you open this document up, it will look somewhat similar to essay number one, 
However, the difference is it will require outside research to back up your paper, okay? And we will talk about that right now. So let me click into essay number two. Again, you're gonna want to look at the details here. So again, we have um, the, the due date is the 18th of October. The maximum number of points that you can be awarded on this essay is 150, all right? Your first one was 100. This one is 150. So it should let you know that it's similar in scope, but a little more complex because you have this extra requirement thrown in there in the, in the form of outside research. You're gonna have to do a little bit of outside research to bring in some sources to back up what you're talking about, okay? All right, so let's go into the assessment. Again, everyone that is taking 101 this semester across all the classes is writing the same type of essay. All right, so you're not writing something that other students in other classes are not writing. It's very, very similar. All right, so just like essay number one, you're gonna to wanna to click and download this file which is your requirement document. Again, I give you a little bit of uh, an introduction here in the assignment content box, but it, it, it's, it would really uh, benefit you to just go ahead and download the PDF and open it up and read the whole thing, okay? Can you, uh, now since I've switched views here, can you all see this PDF document that's opened up in my browser? Yes, anybody give me a thumbs up? Okay, good, all right. All right, so as we peruse through this, one, you're gonna notice that the length of the paper is similar in scope to essay number one, approximately two and a half pages, about 650 words, okay? General rules for the essay are almost a carbon copy to number one. I want you to avoid fast and easy answers, don't want you to write about the obvious so quickly. Uh, avoid the five standard five paragraph essay. Be, be flexible, try to mix it up a little bit. Talk about more top uh, subtopics. If you have enough research to back it up, be, be willing to go above and beyond if necessary. Talk about more, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Don't be afraid to talk about more subtopics than just the standard three, all right? Generate your focus question, which at the same same time, we're talking about a very focused thesis statement. And make sure you proofread for errors in, in, uh, in grammar, spelling, punctuation, and other mechanics, okay? Again, it's extremely helpful if you bring somebody in to proofread your paper before you submit it. That way you get some kind of quality feedback there to help you out, okay? All right, so, Mr. Uh, Marcelino asked a question, what is a literacy narrative? Well, as we all know, a narrative is a story, okay? It is a story that explains the nature of something. Um, it can be something personal, personal to you that only you have experienced in your life or a narrative can involve uh, multiple characters, people that are close to you, family, friends, etc. Okay, but the basic goal is to walk the reader through a story, a narrative, explaining about a, uh, you're explaining a topic using uh, the device of a, of a narrative, a story, okay, to explain to the reader um, what that topic is all about, okay. Um, now, next week, we will go into greater detail about all of the aspects that, uh, of, a, of an essay that can make it a liter literacy narrative. Um, as you can see here, I've got some pages in the textbook that I really want you to uh, research this week, learn about, specifically chapter 10 of your text, which starts on page 75, I believe. Yep, so page 75, 
starts the the discussion about what is a narrative and specifically a literacy narrative in relation to writing an essay okay uh, and they offer some wonderful examples in the book from pages 75 through 97 so you might want to read through a couple of these narratives these essays in a narrative form to kind of get a feel for how the style uh, and how the, the the format works, okay? Again, we'll talk more in depth about a literacy narrative next week. Um, this week, we're gonna focus more on the research project, our research process, but next week we'll dive into uh, more intermediate topics, okay? We're gonna start moving away from the MLA, the boring formatting, the documentation stuff, um, after last week's lecture and then this week's lecture, I think you're going to have enough under your belt to have a general understanding of how to use MLA in a documentation sense to um, uh, correctly identify outside research and, and cite and give credit to those authors whose work you're using. Okay. And so next week, we'll start looking at different writing styles and different writing uh, techniques um to prepare you mainly for essay number two three and four okay all right so again if for those of you uh who really want to be extremely proactive i would encourage you to uh read through these examples from page 75 through 79 um there's a lot of great um tips in here there's there's some some good stories that kind of offer wonderful examples of how to use this type of style um, again, and even in page 61 or chapter 61 on page 670 or 687, um, there are some more examples through readings. Okay. Some more essays in here that, that offer, you know, more of a, a narrative type essay from 687 to 713. There's some other examples in there for those of you who really want to kind of master this technique, uh, I threw some extra examples in there for you. All right. And then again, on page 88, you don't necessarily have to have a topic identified right now um, at this moment. But what you can do is look on page 88 here, and you can read through the list of different topics that uh, are suggested there where you can Think back on your personal experience, whether it's in school or, or those of you who are professionals. Um, you, can, you can think of a topic where you have this certain um, experience uh, per personally or professionally, a story that happened in some point in your life that can really uh, describe that topic in greater detail. Okay. Again, you're not limited to the topics that you necessarily see on this page. Um, you can open it up and write about a topic of your own choosing, okay? The only thing I ask you to do is do not write about the same topic you choose you chose for essay number one. Come up with a different topic, okay? Uh, again, considering this is more of a story-based essay, uh, I would choose something in your personal or professional life that you could really bring to the forefront and at the same time, maybe you can bring in a couple of outside sources. Uh, speaking of which, for some reason, I've been having a lot of trouble with Blackboard since we had that outage on Monday. Those of you who um, uh, had class on Monday or you were trying to get some assignments turned in on Monday, we had a major outage with uh, uh, the campus email and the campus um, uh, Blackboard. Ever since then, I've been having major, major issues getting content to update. So this document, I want to try to update it one more time. I'm going to try to do that after class tonight. But for some reason, this document is still not updated. There's supposed to be a section down at the bottom that says um, outside sources, two outside sources are required for this essay. Okay. In other words, you're going to have to do a little bit of research about your topic when you've selected your topic. Use the library database or use Google search engine to find two sources that kind of back up um, 
what you're going to write about in essay number two. Okay. Again, um, don't worry about so much identifying a topic tonight. I would have a goal uh, when we meet next Thursday night, having that topic clear in your mind. Okay. So uh, between now and next week, you know, read through the sections that I have listed here in the document, chapter 10, chapter 61. And while you're doing that, go ahead and think of a topic that you would like to write about for essay number two. Again, it's a two and a half page document. Uh, not, you, I'm not asking you to write a dissertation. I'm not asking you to write a novel about this experience. Uh, but the manner in which you're going to write this, you're, it's going to be a combination of a story followed by empirical data uh, to uh, fully illustrate the topic that you've selected, okay? Any questions so far? I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but I've got a lot to talk about. So you said wanted... two liable sources, right? Yes, two um, two credible sources for this paper. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk about where to find some of these things tonight and how to conduct this research process. Uh, I can go ahead and tell you, out of the the two classes that I had this week with 101, um, after we and I, I gave the same lecture this week. After I got through, more students than not really feel more comfortable comfortable about doing research. Um, I'm sorry, Ms. Davis. I don't know if your speakers are. If it's my speaker, I can't hear you. I may be having trouble with my connection. Yeah. Okay, you just, I just hear you now. Okay. Okay, yeah. All right, so I'm going to put in here, I am having trouble with my connection. All right, so, um, yeah, I'm having the same internet issues that a lot of you all are having. Ever since that damn hurricane, um, our internet has been very, very unstable. Are other people experiencing the same thing still? It's absolutely nuts. All right, so let me open this up again in case nobody, uh, some people didn't hear me. Any other questions about essay number two? Okay. Um, again, it's going to be due the 18th of October. So for those of you who tend to forget, put that in your iPhone, put that in your Android phone, put it in the calendar. That way it will um, send you a little alert and let you know that, hey, this is, this is a major, major assignment that's due. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Reading responses. Do we have any reading responses coming up anytime? Yeah, we've got a reading response number two that's coming up Sunday. And just to remind you all, those of you who have not turned this in yet, where? Uh, here we go. Okay. Move my chat here. So again, this reading response is specifically, I chose this article specifically for all of the gamers out there. Uh, those of you who love to game, whether it's on the Xbox or PS5 or, or PS4, XPS5 is not even out yet, or the uh, PC, this is an article right up your alley, okay? This is an article about, and it's a current event as well, uh, about a gamer who was prosecuted for virtually stealing. Virtually, st I can never say that word, virtually stealing content within the game. Okay. Um, what does it mean to virtually steal content within, within the game, sir? So you'll have to read the articles because they, they really define what, what exactly he did. But in a nutshell, uh, I can give you a little preview. Uh, if you as a gamer find a way of manipulating the game, either within the game or using external code uh, in order to gain a unfair advantage, uh, 
you could possibly be prosecuted for <laughs> digital theft, uh, uh, according like to this a cheat code, sir? Sir? Like using a cheat code? Uh, I don't think it's so much a cheat code that's allowed by the game, but using some kind of method to manipulate or alter the game in a way it wasn't designed in order to gain an unfair advantage. Okay. Okay. Um, so, and the reason why this is a, a, an unprecedented case is because we've never really had anybody prosecuted for this before uh, because you're basically paying for access to the game to do whatever you want to do um, within the rules of the game, of course, but uh, we've never had an incident where somebody had been prosecuted before. So I cannot wait to read your one page response for all of those of you who enjoy gaming in some form or fashion, either on your phones or through a console or the PC. Um, this will be an interesting article for you. Again, it's only a 250 word essay, one page or less, um, basically answering the questions. Again, there's a, there's a group of five question, five question groups on uh, page 788. And uh, I want you to select one of the question groups and write a 250 word essay answering all of the questions within that group, okay? Um, sir, are one of the uh, question groups easy or are they hard? Mm, I would say they're pretty easy. They're pretty self-evident. Once you read through the article, uh, you can look at the question groups and kind of reference back to the article. You, you should, it shouldn't, uh, in other words, the questions aren't written in a way to trick you. Um, it should be pretty self-evident. Pretty self-evident. Okay, yep. God, thank you, sir. What is the due date for read and response number two? That is, um, should be the 4th of October. So Sunday, Sunday night at 1159. Yep, is that right? Yeah, the 4th of October, no? Yeah, Sunday night. Yes, yeah, Sunday night uh, at 1159, October 4th, okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So that takes, Lord, that's, that irritates me. Okay. So that takes care of essay number two, major paper coming up on the 18th of October and also read and response number two, which is coming up on the 4th of October, okay? All right, so a um, couple more ad things before, admin things before I move on to uh, the lecture, all right? So for those of you who have classes in Niceville, um, I understand Crestview, really never had an experience with this, but for those of you who had classes in Niceville, you probably noticed this week uh, that there was a change in allowing people to come back on campus. Uh, they didn't really do a, I don't think they really sent out a mass email explaining the, the cause for that change, but uh, from what they sent us faculty, uh, in response to the governor of Florida changing the COVID uh, response phase last week and opening up restaurants and bars and other public places, uh, the college has decided to no longer conduct temperature checks and ID checks at the Niceville campus and the Crestview campus. Now again, um, many of my students told me Monday night and Wednesday night that they had never had a temperature check at all in Crestview never had their ID checked, never had their temperature checked. And I was not aware of that. Um, I had mine checked every time I went there. So um, I don't know how they got around that, but in Niceville, you could not physically get on the campus uh, unless you went through that booth and the main entrance. So uh, again, for those of you who have returned to campus and 
you weren't aware of what the what the change was that's the change okay they're no longer requiring temperature checks and uh, id checks now i hate that because i think the temperature checks was a good thing Yeah, your speaker's out again. Sir, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah, I can hear you now. now. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, um, the uh, temperature checks was an awesome thing because I thought it was a deterrent for those people who were borderline uh, and, you know, it, it deterred them from coming to campus and possibly uh, spreading not just COVID, but anything else. Um, so my, my advice to all of you who still have physical classrooms, um, make sure you wear your mask because I've seen students in the, in the, in the building on Niceville, campus of Niceville, and Crestview, some people are still walking around without a mask on. Um, I think that part is still a requirement, okay? So I highly encourage you to wear your mask, bring your um, sanitizer, you know, let's, let's still have somewhat of a, of a, a vig have maintained some kind of vigilance here because, uh, you know, this, 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 situation's not over yet. I know a lot of people are walking around still acting like nothing's wrong. Um, you know, there, there's still people dying. I can, I can't tell you the name, but I can tell you it's hit home for me because, um, where I work on Eglin Air Force Base, our division chief passed away a week and a half ago from COVID. Uh, so I know for a fact that it's real. Uh, I know for a fact that it's deadly and because it impacted one of our airmen uh, and, and, you know, in our division chief, um, it impacted us personally uh, where I work at Eglin. So I implore all of you, please wear your masks, please use your sanitizer. Uh, even if you don't think it's a big deal, uh, there are those of us who have experienced it firsthand uh, through the loss of uh, somebody that was close to us. So. Um, do, you know, I just ask each and every one of us to do our part. All right, enough about that. Um, so tonight, I tell you what, I'm going to take about a five minute break here because I drank way too much Coca-Cola. Uh, give me about five minutes. Um, let me go take care of my business and then I'll come back at, uh, 7 15 and then we're gonna talk about the research process tonight, okay? I don't anticipate this taking up the full time tonight. So yes, you will probably be getting out early tonight. Uh, I don't wanna introduce a new topic once I'm, I'm done with this one because I don't wanna to have to pick it back up on the next week and, and break the flow. So um, we, will, uh, we will reconvene at about 7.15. Hopefully my internet connection will stabilize when that happens and uh, we will talk about the research process. Okay. Awesome. Thank y'all. Oh, there was prob that was prob that was my problem a bit. Start this up again. Oh, wait, so let me see. And click the record button. And I hope my internet connection is a little better. Okay. All right, so let me share my screen again. One second. All right, 
share my screen. All right, so I have updated the course materials. Uh, if you remember last week, we had this uh, PowerPoint called Academic Writing MLA. Well, I have updated that. That one did push through, as I can see, um, thankfully. It's just intermittent what gets updated and what's not. So I'm going to talk about the research process using some additional slides that I posted in this PowerPoint. Now, um, as far as your textbook is concerned, the information that I'm talking about or will talk about tonight also comes from the textbook. And it starts on page 47 and runs through about page, uh, chapter 47 and runs through about chapter 52, okay? So um, you want a little more information about some of the topics we're talking about. The bulk of, of my lecture tonight comes from chapters 47 through 52, okay? Now, I don't encourage you to, or don't recommend that you just go through that and memorize the whole thing. That's not necessary. And in fact, what I've tried to do is simplify the process even more to not water it down, but make it a little more applicable to where you are at right now in English 101, okay? So, having said that, let me bring up the uh, PowerPoint. And again, we're gonna talk about the research process. Things are in the way. Do you say chapter 57? Our right, chapter 47 through 50. Oh, 47. Okay. Yeah. Chapter 47 through 52. I apologize. I probably misspoke. All right. Here we go. So, slide number six. Here we go. All right. Let me move this out of the way and condense it. Not that I don't like seeing y'all, but. I need two screens here. Gosh, I'm running this whole class out of a laptop. It's crazy. All right. So again, tonight we're going to talk about the research process and all of the things that you need to keep in mind in order to prepare to write an essay that presents two viewpoints. One, your own viewpoint and your own perspective as you did in essay number one. Okay. That was a personal essay. Um, and that, that essay presented your perspective and only your perspective, okay? Now, from essay number two, three, and four, you're going to be writing an essay that presents two or more perspectives. One, of course, is your own, which is the most important one, but also two through infinity, all right? Or, right, for example, for essay number two, two through four, because you got to have two outside or two through three, you got to have two, at least two outside sources. Okay. Um, you're going to be presenting the viewpoints and perspectives of other people, namely professionals who have some sense of academic credibility and integrity and authority to write about a particular topic. Okay. All right. So again, I've gone through the chapters in the books, to try to condense this down in a form that really makes it simple for you all to understand and kind of keeps you on track, okay? Not watered down, but to help you keep on track, all right? So um, as I said up here, before you start writing about any topic, it's extremely important, okay? Almost vital to the success of that essay that you have a fundamental understanding about the, the, the topic you want to write about, okay? As you all know, it's extremely hard to write about what you don't know, all right? You've got this, this body of knowledge that you're working with, things that you do know and things that you don't know, and then there's that small sliver that of things that you just didn't even know were possible, okay? And being able to understand and sift through that which you know and what you don't know can be vital in, in being successful in writing about a particular um, subject, okay? Namely, focusing on things that you don't know or that you do know 
and supplement that with outside research to fill in the gaps of things that you don't know. Okay. And that's why we call it a, a two phased process. All right. The research process plays an important role in helping you with topic number one up there, bullet number one. Okay. Two things to prepare the topic that you want to write about and the composition of the essay in a way that effectively communicates your perspective and the outside research that you're presenting to your reader, okay? In other words, if you don't compose it in a way to, that gives the reader a clear idea of what you're writing about and the direction that you're going with that paper, you might as well have not even written it because most readers are just gonna discard it and push it aside. Okay, and all that time and energy that you put into um, writing about that topic will be wasted. Okay, so it's extremely important that you prepare yourself mentally, especially mentally, but sometimes even physically to execute this five step process uh, effectively and as efficiently as possible. Okay. All right, so that's going to move us into the next bullet, which is five-step process. Before I go through these things, I, I think it's extremely critical for you all to understand that to be successful in executing proper research methods, you must execute these steps in sequential order. And you cannot execute the, uh, the subsequent step until you fully extinguish the previous one, okay? In other words, don't put the cart before the horse and feel like you've got to rush through all five steps quickly in order to be successful. I guarantee if you put the cart before the horse and you rush through this, and you don't put the time and energy that's necessary in each step, you're going to have a, that, an essay that is not going to fire on all cylinders, okay? I know I'm throwing a lot of metaphors out there, but I think you follow me. All right. So again, this is a five step process. All right. So number one, identify the topic with a general thesis statement. Okay. Anytime you're going to, you're preparing to write about any subject, it's important that you one, identify the topic that you want to write about at the same time, don't feel pressured to write the perfect thesis statement at the very beginning. I know that this is kind of um, somewhat of a contradiction what you may have learned in high school because that's what they really focused on, have that strong thesis statement up front. And that's fine if you're writing a personal essay. But when you're conducting research in order to compose an academic research paper or a formal paper, um, you're really not going to have a full understanding and awareness of your thesis until you've conducted the research. Okay. You can, you're going to have a general idea of where you want to go when you first start, but it's not until you actually execute the research process that you're really going to understand the full, um, um, the full aspect of, of all the aspects of, of this topic that you're going to write about. And at that point, that's when you're going to have, be able to revisit the thesis statement and strengthen it. Okay. So step number one, identify your topic, select that topic and, you know, push forward with it and just come up with a general thesis statement. Okay. All right, so as I go through this process, I'm going to have an example here to kind of lay this out for you, okay? So I think you all remember a couple of weeks ago, we, we created an example of uh, trying to find the right college in order, you know, to, to move on to get that bachelor's degree, right? All right, so I'm going to be the guinea pig and I'm going to say, all right, class, uh, I'm going to identify a topic for a new essay because I am in high school and I know what I want to major in, but I don't know where I would need to go to do that. I don't know what the financial obligations are going to be and, and the location, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to have to conduct some research. So what I do know at this point before I've conducted the research is 
I have to go to school. I have to get that bachelor's degree and I want to major in meteorology. Okay. That right there is a general thesis statement. I'm going to write a paper on this topic of my pursuit to identify the right college in order to uh, pursue a degree in meteorology. All right. Very general. And at that point, okay, what I can say about that general thesis statement is if you don't develop it further, a lot of people will go be like, okay, and what? So what? You want to go to meteorology school? That's fine. But where are you going? How are you going to get there? All right. So that's where the research comes in in order to strengthen that. So now we've started with a very general thesis statement. And the example is I'm in high school. I need to find the right school that's going to allow me to pursue a degree in meteorology because I want to graduate with a bachelor's degree in meteorology. Outside of that, I don't know anything. I just have a general idea. Okay. All right. So now I've executed step number one. I've identified the topic for the essay and I've developed a general thesis statement. Okay. Now I understand that in order to really fully develop this essay, I've got to do some research now. So I'm going to move on to step number two. And step number two is this, find sources of information and data that can help me fully explore the topic and give me a range, uh, a knowledge base to write about that topic, okay? So, now I'm going to turn it over to you. You guys are going to help me, the high school student, figure this out. And you can use the chat or you can chime in on the, on the uh, mic. Um, let me bring the chat window up here. Okay. Again, I've, I've identified step number one. I've executed it. Now I'm ready for step number two. Now I need to find sources of information to help me develop my topic, which is find the right school to pursue a degree in meteorology. Who would like to give me a source? Where should I go in order to conduct some research? What would I do in that, in that instance? Who wants to take a stab at it? Um, I would guess you would say to interview um, certain colleges with the administrative of some people. I'm not too sure. Okay, no, uh, I'm going to write this down. So you said to go and talk to um, colleges like uh, the guidance counselors. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to visit colleges to talk to guidance counselors. Okay, somebody just come into the to the chat and said, you can go to college websites. Absolutely. Right. Most college websites out there have a list of their um, uh, curriculum. They have, uh, you know, websites uh, dedicated to their individual degree programs. That's a great resource to go to college websites. Okay. What else? What else is available to me as a new high school student? Sir, I have a different one. You can visit the college websites. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I think that's the same one that was brought up in the chat, going to the college websites. I know. Go to yeah. visit, same thing. But, but yeah. Thank you. Yep. I know. You, what, what, uh, do you have another idea for one, Mr. Marcelino? Hmm, what I else know. Do in um, uh, to that? I know. How's about uh, contact the, uh, the uh, college phone numbers then, I suppose? Okay, so give them a call? Yes, give them yep. a call. Okay, we could call. 
Yeah, we could call the guidance counselors or the academic advisors. That's a good one. Well, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Come on. What about some of our other students out there, high school students? You guys are going to be doing this here pretty soon. What What have you done so far? Um, you you can interview some people in the medical field. Oh, Just you're ask them which school they went to. You just broke up there as well, Miss Baldwin. Try that one more time. Okay. You can ask people like work in the medical field. Okay, you yeah. Them, like which is cool to and their experience. Very, very good. You could interview some people who are professionals in that field, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's that's an excellent one. Heck yeah, you can call some of these meteorologists on the TV stations around here and interview them. Say, hey, what school did you go to? Um, you know, what field, what what individual discipline in meteorology did you major in? Did you major in hurricanes or winter storms or whatnot? Yeah, that's a great resource, interview professionals. Okay. Uh, let's see, Miss Irk suggested you could research a website that ranks schools meteorology programs absolutely that is a wonderful resource there are many magazines and and newspapers out there that do this on an annual basis they will rank schools and their programs schools and programs in newspaper articles and, and give you a ranking. What are the top schools in the, in the field of business? What are some of the top schools uh, in, in um, uh, bioengineering? And what are some top schools in this example? What are some of the top schools in meteorology? That's a great one. Uh, let's see, who else? You can ask other people who have pre previously went to that college. Oh, absolutely. You can come up with a pool, a pool of colleges that you're interested in that offer your degree program. And you can interview people who've attended that school. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, what else do we need to think about when we're trying to identify a school? Someone who has not chimed in yet. Mr. Zamorski, what about you? I couldn't think of any at the moment. Okay. Uh, Mr. Murphy, you still having audio problems? Uh, what about Miss Hun? Um, wait. College fairs? Like, you know how, like, you know, I don't know. So we, we've, all right, let me, let me help you out here. We've already narrowed down some colleges that offer the degree plan. Uh, we've called the school to interview them and see what the academic requirements are. Um, we have also gotten some supplemental information about some of the disciplines that they offer within that school. Uh, we've interviewed professionals who have gone to that school. Uh, and we've consulted magazines and uh, newspapers that offer rankings uh, about the, the uh, uh, proficiency and academic excellence of these schools. Uh, what are some other things that we would or that I need to think about uh, before I decide on the right school? What are, what are some other things outside of degree plan? outside of academic requirements, outside of um, rankings. What else should I consider when I'm researching this? Well, I know when I was in high school, we had these um, events that they let us know, like, hey, we have a college event that's gonna be attending here. You can attend those and gather my information from there and go to their booths and ask them personally for those people that are there at those events. Absolutely, what did they call those things? Um, uh, they're like a recruiting event, right? right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, the chat's going crazy now. Let's see. 
Yes. Yes. Thank you, Miss Pygott. Yes. Take a bow. Come on the chat or, or come on and take a bow. Tuition. Because we're not going to the school for free. Ah, there you go. Take a bow. Absolutely. Finances, right? Uh, what are the tuition costs in order to attend this school versus another school that I'm considering? Okay. Uh, let's see. What else is in here? Graduation. Okay, it's correct. Graduation rates. Absolutely. What's the graduation rate? for those people who have attended that school or that university at that school, okay? So yeah, I, hope, I know you probably heard that uh, my father-in-law is tormenting my son right now, they're playing. So he is screaming in the living room. Uh, okay, so just looking at the pool of research here, um, as we're condu conducting or executing step number two, I have found sources of information here that talk about um, the degree plans offered at several uh, universities. I've done research into tuition costs for those universities, looked at the graduation rates. Uh, I've interviewed some professionals who are alums of that of those universities to talk to them about, you know, what was the program like? Um, you know, how, how did it prepare you to uh, enter into a career in meteorology. I visited those colleges uh, to get a feel for them, right? Uh, and when you do that, you kind of get a feel for the location as well, right? You know, some universities are located in a big town, some are located in a small town, all right? Awesome, so right here, I have a list of about 10 different subtopics that I have identified as I'm conducting research into this one topic, okay? The topic was to find the right university to pursue, pursue a degree in meteorology. And as I'm doing my research, look at here, you all have helped me simulate this. I now have a pool of 10 different subtopics with a bunch of sources, right? And these different sources have come from websites. They've, some have come from magazines. Some have come from newspapers. Uh, there's a couple of them in here that are interviews, personal interviews. And I'm sure I could even throw a book or two in here as well, talking about the location. Uh, what is, what is, you know, what's the location, the town in which this university is located? What's it like? Is it a big town, a small town? Is it, you know, a great place to visit and, and live? Or is it one of those you're going to have to worry about, right? Um, you see what I've done here? I've created a huge pool of sources, different source types of websites, magazines, uh, newspapers, personal interviews and books. And I have 10 different sources to choose from. That's awesome, all right? This is a simulation, of course, but this is what you're gonna be doing when you're researching a topic. You're gonna to find books, you're gonna find magazine articles, newspaper articles, you're gonna possibly conduct personal interviews with people uh, who have knowledge about that topic. Um, you're gonna visit websites, uh, read some books, some even eBooks, right? Diverse group of sources uh, that we have to choose from here. And let me scroll back to my PowerPoint. And as you can see here, all right, what we have just done is we have successfully completed step number two. We have created a pool of data with different data types. We're looking at books, magazines, newspaper articles, websites, et cetera. And we've also identified subtopics out of those source types, okay? So now the most important step in the research process, and I want each and every one of you to listen as I know this is boring material, but it's extremely important, okay? 
Step number three, by far, and I should have put it in bold print so that you could all really zero in on it. Step number three here is going to be your most important step in the research process. Yes, sir. Uh, step three says to evaluate the sources for validity and integrity, correct? That is correct. Thanks that is lot. correct. Okay. Step number three evaluate the sources that you've identified in step number two, right? Actually, so you, uh, sirs, I, I think I was wrong. Step three focuses the uh, focuses upon the uh, five-step process, which is to identify the topic with general thesis, thesis statement. No, 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 no. This process. one, right. So the five-step process right here, you see my cursor? Oh, yeah. Okay, step one is here. Step two is here, and then step three is here. Yes. So we're on step three right now. Evaluate the sources for validity and integrity. Okay. Okay. Um, sir, how, how long will this class take? Um, it, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll do our best to get out before uh, ahead of time, but I'm going a little longer than... I anticipate it, but we'll get through it. Okay. We'll get through okay, it. Okay, sir. Thanks. Okay. Uh, like I said, step number three, evaluate the sources for validity and integrity. And again, these are the sources that we've accumulated in step number two. Okay. Which is why it's important to um, fully execute step number two. Evaluate the sources. Now, how do you do that? Anybody want to take a stab at what I'm talking about here? Evaluate the sources for validity and integrity. What do I mean by that? Is it to confirm that the sources are true and go on to like if they're giving you uh, graduation rates, if you're speaking to yeah. a person, right? You go online and check if it's con if it to confirm it. Absolutely. And also, in addition to what you just said, also to verify whether or not it's relevant to the topic that we're wanting to write about. Okay. I can't tell you how many times I've seen students, even in the 102 class, write about a topic and they pad the works cited page, which has a list of all the sources that they use for that topic, for that paper. And half the sources ended up have nothing to do with the topic at all. Okay. Why? Because they really didn't evaluate the sources that they were citing for their paper. Okay. So that's what I mean by evaluate the sources. So in our example here, I've got this huge pool, right? This huge list of all the different sources for my paper. I'm going to go through each one of these books. I'm going to go through each one of the magazine articles and newspaper articles and the websites that I've accumulated. And I'm going to sift through them and I'm going to verify, number one, are they relevant to the topic I'm writing about? If they are, I'm going to put them into this pile, okay? This is the relevant pile over here. If that source is not relevant, as I'm reading through the source, and I'm like, well, this really, on the at face value, it seems like it relates, but as I'm reading through the data, there's no data in there that really applies to the topic I'm writing about. Then you kick that source to the curb, okay? You're gonna put that in another pile off to the side that says not relevant, okay? At the same time, you're gonna evaluate each one of those sources based on integrity, okay? Was the content composed by an author who is an expert in this field or someone that has credentials to write about this um, topic? Okay. Give you an example. Someone who is in the field of meteorology who's been, who's been a, a weather person for, say, 20 years and has conducted a lot of research you pull one of their articles to write about that topic, um, that's what we would consider a credible source, right? It's written by an author who's been, who's been practicing in that field for over 20 years, who's conducted a lot of research and has credentials, okay? They have a lot of um, uh, publications under their belt, 
They've been peer reviewed. They've been verified. Okay. That's what we consider a source that has integrity versus Billy Bob's webpage who may be, you know, it may be well-intentioned. It may be composed by someone who, you know, in an amateurish way has really observed the weather over, over the years, but they don't have credentials to really verify the integrity of the data they're presenting. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the things that you can do when you're, when you're working with this pool of data or these pool of sources is you can do a little research, not only into, you know, reading the, the source that you pulled, but look at who the author is and do a little web search on the author. Verify that the author of that source really is a professional in about that topic or in the field of study in which you're writing about versus Billy Bob, who's just thrown up a web page on Facebook or on the internet somewhere, and he really doesn't have a degree or he really doesn't have any credentials under his belt. He's just a, an enthusiast that loves writing about it, okay? So that, that's what I mean by evaluate the sources for validity and integrity. Make sure that the data and the information within the source is relevant to the topic and exclude those that are not, and then verify the integrity of the, uh, of, of the author who composed that material, okay? Do a little research into that author. I'm not saying you have to spend two hours on it, but just do a quick web search, you know? If they're credentialed, chances are they're gonna have a little bio on their website or their Facebook uh, page or their Twitter feed. They'll have a little bio or a link to what their credentials are. And if they have those credentials and you're working with a, a valid source, okay? All right. And again, I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but this is, this is the step that really trips up more students than not. Uh, they don't, many students do not take the time, uh, one, because they really don't know, or two, because they're rushing in order to get this paper done because they've waited till the last minute. They really don't conduct a full evaluation of the sources they're working with, checking for the validity and the integrity, okay? So I highly, highly suggest and highly recommend to each and every one of you, when you're working on essays two, three, and four, and you're doing that research, take the time to really verify the source that you're wanting to use for your paper and analyze the person that's writing it. Okay, do a little do a little background search on that author to make sure they are who they say they are. Okay, does that make sense? Do I have any questions about that? Because I got a lot of questions about that step this week. Okay, let me check the chat. Don't want to lose anybody. All right, so. <clears throat> let's pretend for a second. Now, me, I'm the high school student. I'm doing all this research. I've identified all these sources. I've gone through and I've evaluated my pool of information. I've analyzed all of my book sources, my websites, and my newspaper and uh, magazine sites. Um, look through the interviews and stuff. I've separated the good stuff from the bad. And now I've got this, I've got this pool that I'm working with. All right. What do I do now? I fully executed step number three. Now you're going to go on to step number four, which is synthesize the sources. In other words, you're going to evaluate all these sources again, and you're going to start grouping them into categories that create subtopics. Okay. That's why it really behooves you to go above and beyond to get a bigger pool of sources because what you're going to do is you're going to start seeing patterns develop between each of these sources. You're going to see some sources that really spend a lot of time and attention talking about the location. Um, all right, hold on. It's, as far as I'm, I'm going to use my example again, okay? So let's say I've got my 10 sources here, okay? 
and I'm, I've already evaluated them. Now I'm looking to synthesize them. Well, what I've noticed here is that I've got one, two, three sources that all talk about location. Okay. And then I have another three sources here that talk about finances. And then I have four sources here that talk about degree plans and academic requirements. Okay. And I've, I've been able to identify these categories by grouping the sources into categories. Okay. And so what I've done is I've been able to identify common links between each of these groups of sources. So now that leads me to my 10 here. Okay. So as you can see right here, just as well, let me get it in the angle of the camera, right? So three of the sources I've got grouped into the location, three I've got grouped into finances, and the other four talk about degree plans and academic requirements, okay? Three different subtopics. So anybody want to take a guess as what that allows me to do with my overall topic of my paper? It could um, give you your worksite pages and specifically find someone that talks about all that one topic or yep. create the paragraphs for it to separate, to put all categories into that. You just hit the nail on the head. Look what it's going to allow me to do. I'm going to write. I wish I had a whiteboard on this thing. <laughs> Again, I'm going to use the standard five paragraph essay. Not, not that I want you to do that, but as a teaching tool. Okay. Paragraph number one is going to be my intro. Paragraph number five is going to be my conclusion. All right. So here's my outline. Now, using this pool of topics that I've identified right here, I hope this shows up on the video when I publish it later. What I can do now is to go back to my outline and say, okay, well, category number one can be paragraph or section number two. I could talk about location. Paragraph three or section three can talk about finances. And Paragraph four or section four can talk about degree plans. Okay. So this is what I've done now with those categories that I've identified from my sources. I have the body of my paper defined by the categories that I group my sources in. Okay. So Ms. Cisneros, you're absolutely right. It can define the sections or the paragraphs that I want to write about at the essay. What is the other thing? And I think you're on the tip of it here. I'm going to ask you again. What else it, does it allow me to do? Uh, create its timeline of how to put the work cited information on the bottom. Of the absolutely. Yep. It can, it can help you do that, but there's something right up here that it can allow me to do. Oh, uh, form your thesis. Yes. So you remember what did I start? I started off with a very general thesis statement, right? And my general statement was, I want to identify the right university that will allow me to pursue a degree in meteorology. Okay. Very general. Now, what can I do with that thesis statement? I can go back and strengthen it by saying, I have identified and I'm just going to say, for, uh, for example, I have identified Florida State University as the perfect university to pursue a degree in meteorology because there's the key word. And I'm going to say this word again. I'm probably going to say it twice. Because. Because. All right. Let me write it up here in bold letters. Because. It is in the perfect location relative to where my hometown is, it offers a reasonable financial plan to allow me to enroll and pursue my goals there. 
at the same time, it also allows me to pursue a degree in meteorology, which is something I've always wanted to attain. Okay, now that's a very bloated thesis statement, but do you, you see as an example what I did there? I started with a very general statement starting out before I even researched the topic, which is I want to find the right university to pursue a degree in meteorology. And after I conducted the research and identified the categories, now I have reasons for making that decision. Okay, because of these three categories, it's that simple. Absolutely, that's that simple. Okay, and so what that process has allowed me to do is to strengthen this thesis statement to the point to where when I, as a reader, read the introduction to that essay, I know exactly where, where you're going. Okay, I know what your end goal is, is because you want to explain why you want to get a degree in meteorology. And at the same time, because of those three reasons after the word because, you're going to tell me how you're going to get there, right? Based on location, based on finances, and based on degree plans. Bam, that easy, that simple. Okay, so that's why step four is important as well synthesizing your pool of research allows you to identify categories that will create subtopics in the body of your paper ever how many you have each and every one of them will give you a reason why your thesis statement is or is not true okay in this case the thesis statement is true because of these three categories. All right, see how that works? And using that example, does that make it easier for you all to develop and strengthen a thesis statement? Awesome, awesome. Give me some thumbs up out there for you who are not on, on camera. I wanna make sure you all are, are actually here. Yeah, some people aren't here. <laughs> some people just log in to get credit, huh? No, I'm kidding. Everybody chimed in. I'm just joking. All right. So, and then again, the last step, the last step is extremely important too, and that's integrating the source data into the body of the paper using appropriate documentation methods. In other words, what Ms. Cisneros was referring to, the works cited page on the very last page of her essay will be a detailed list of every source that you have identified as valid with integrity to be pertinent to the topic you're writing about. That's what the works cited page does. In addition to that, the citations within the paper itself indicate specific information that you're pulling from those sources. Okay, and that's what we mean by integrate the source data using the appropriate documentation, uh, documentation methods in MLA. Okay, all right. Any questions about the five step process? Uh, with the works at page part, you want in alphabetical order or in the order of when it's being yeah, taught? Yeah, alphabetical or order. Yeah, alphabetical order. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great question. A lot of times students think that, yeah, it's, it's grouped by those categories, which, you know, to be honest with you, that makes more of a logical sense because if I'm at a certain point in the essay and I'm in a certain category, I could quickly reference the beginning or the middle or the end of that works cited page to find that reference instead of looking alphabetically. But, um, I don't know, maybe that's something MLA needs to consider in the future, but that's a great idea. Makes a heck of a lot more sense to me than the way they're doing it now. All right. All right, so, whoa, what happened there? Somebody hacked in? Wikipedia. Yeah, we don't want to see Michael Scott again. Okay, all right, so let me see what time it is here. 
All right, eight o'clock. We've got a little bit of time. So in the in the subsequent slides, what I've done is offered you some tips. Okay, things to think about as you're my, you know, as you're executing each one of these steps, one through five in a sequential order. Okay. I'm not going to read through all of these verbatim, uh, but I will highlight some of the ones that I think are most important that I really want you to think about. Um, namely, especially in the literary arts. Okay. You won't do that so much here in 101, but when you move on to 102, especially if you take my 102 class, you're going to be writing several papers about literary works because 102 is a literary analysis class. Okay. Um, and, and at that point, the type of sources that you're going to be working with is extremely important. And those sources come in two different flavors. One, we call that a primary source. Okay. And as I've notated here, a primary source is anything of a historical record, a literary record, an eyewitness record, a field report, diary, etc. In other words, if the text was written by the person who is the authority on the subject or was there at the time in which it occurred and they're writing a narrative to explain what happened, that's what we consider a primary source, okay? In the literary field, that's what we consider to be the author, okay? So in the example of Romeo and Juliet, William Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet is the primary source for that topic, okay? Shakespeare wrote the work, he created the characters, he created the, the plot, inserted the themes, the conflict, etc. So he is the primary authority on that literary text. In addition to that, most of the sources that you're going to come across here in 101 are going to be of the secondary type, okay? And secondary sources are sources that we consider to be scholastic books and articles, journal articles, reviews, or any other work that attempts, and I'm going to say attempt because not all secondary sources are successful in doing so, but any source that attempts to interpret a primary source is what we consider to be a secondary source. So going back to my example of William Shakespeare, William Shakespeare wrote uh, Romeo and Juliet. Professor J.R.R. Tolkien composed The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, okay? Professor Tolkien is the primary source on, on that book. Or that series. Um, sir, excuse me, you forgot to mention that um, William Shakespeare also made the story of, of Macbeth. Yes, he did. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. All right. Thank you. All right. So, Professor thank Tolkien you. wrote Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. So, we consider him the primary source for that book. Now, his son Christopher wrote a lot of books about. His father, J.R.R. Tolkien, and his methodology for creating Lord of the Rings. Okay. Those books on that subject we consider to be secondary. Okay. Because those are Christopher's interpretations of the motivations and the inspirations and the illusions and the allegories behind why Tolkien wrote those, those works. Okay. So if you're working with a source, and it is an eyewitness account. It's a literal account. It's a by the authority that, that composed the work. We consider that a primary source. If it's an interpretation of that primary source, in other words, it's, a, it's an article or an opinion paper on why the author wrote it this way, that's what we consider a secondary source. Okay. Now, I bring that to your attention because it's not so much important now in 101, but when you move on to 102 and to future classes, the quality and type of the source is going to be extremely important. You're going to come across some professors that mandate you can use one primary source and two secondary sources or three secondary sources. Okay. So being able to identify if a source is primary versus secondary is extremely important. Okay. Not so much for the scope of this class, 
but if you want to go ahead and get in the habit of of having a mix of one primary and two and three secondaries might not be a bad idea to go ahead and try your hand at that okay but not required at this point all right the other thing that i wanted to mention again i don't mean to beat a dead horse but make sure that the sources that you're using are quality checked and verified for integrity okay in other words i had this question today in my 102 class uh mr davis can i use spark notes as a source for my paper about um tony morrison's recitative and hawthorne's the birthmark no spark notes is not a website that we consider to be academically credible okay so if you have questions about the sources that you're planning to use you are more than welcome to email me links to those sources and i'll check them out for you okay feel free to send me your sources that you want to use for your paper and I'll help you identify whether or not they're academically um, um, valid and whether they have the integrity enough to be considered an academic source, okay? I'll even walk you through the process and finding that out yourself, okay? And again, it's extremely important that we use the academic libraries to find as many of these sources that, is, that we can for our papers. Why? Because a lot of times the library databases will do the data uh, validation and integrity check for you, okay? It's highly, highly, highly unlikely that you will find a source using the library's database system that doesn't have the validity and integrity that, that's required for an academic setting, okay? So, um, which is going to lead me to my next question. Did I give you all a demonstration on how to use the library website to conduct web, uh, searches for topics? Yes, and you also made a recording for us as well. Ah, I am. Okay, good. See, this is what old age does to you. You forget what you talked about the previous week. Getting old sucks. All right. Um, and again, I give you some, some tips here in, in this section as well. All right, so moving on, uh, evaluating the sources. How to consider whether or not a source might be useful. You, these are some questions that you can ask yourself as you're analyzing each and every source that you want to use your paper. Is it reliable? Is it relevant? What are the author's credentials? Again, you, you'll want to do some kind of background uh, research into the author and look at their bio to see whether or not that author is credentialed and an authority on that topic, okay? A lot of times you are able to go to their website, their Facebook page, their Twitter page, uh, or even sometime a literary review to, to find that information, okay? The other thing that you'll want to do is be critical, okay? Every time you find a source for your paper, uh, don't just accept everything you read in there at face value, okay? Be skeptical, uh, be critical while you're reviewing that information. Analyze what are the arguments that the author's trying to make about that topic? Uh, are they trying to persuade you in a certain way of thinking or like the mainstream media does nowadays are trying to persuade you or do they just present the facts to you in an unbiased way and allow you to make your own decision? In other words, do they give you all of the hard data, the empirical data and allow you to make your own decision? Okay, that's extremely important. Being able to recognize the difference between argument, argumentative presentation versus a persuasive type of composition, okay? Does this source support or challenge your own uh, position? Can't tell you how many times students will quote from sources that actually contradict what they're writing about or the, the, the opinion or the thesis statement that they're writing, they're proposing in their paper. They'll, they'll end up sor uh, quoting a source as what they're thinking is support and it ends up contradicting what they're saying, okay? It's not a bad thing to present opposing viewpoints if you're presenting them in a way to validate your own, 
Okay. Don't just throw it in there just to pat it is what I'm trying to say. And always, always, always be mindful of who your audience is. Okay. And what do I mean by that? Being mindful of the audience allows you to filter these sources based on complexity. Okay. So if, if, if an author is right, is you, let's say you found a source and that author is kind of using watered down language that really applies to someone below a grade level or lower grade level than where you are. Uh, that may not be a relevant source to use. So you want to make sure that the, the intended off audiences, all of your sources are at or above your level. Okay. Does that make sense? In other words, don't use uh, sources that are intended for younger audiences as, as sort I've seen that as well. Okay. In other words, if you're writing about a more complex subject, don't use a children's book to back it up. Okay. All right. And also, oh my God, I don't even want to go there, but I ended class the other night, Tuesday night to allow uh, all of the students to watch the presidential debate. That was something. That was, that was, that was a show. I'm yeah, not going to say the word that I wanted to say. I'm just going to go show. That's what it was. Uh, this last statement on this slide. Be mindful of false news and data that may be pre <laughs> presented as a legitimate. I can't even get through this without laughing. Um, yeah, that debate sounded a lot like two old men in a, in a retirement home that were arguing about how cool they were back when they were younger um that god have mercy i'm just going to stop there i don't want to offend anybody all i can say is this the best we can do um all right so let's see moving on to to synthesization of ideas uh what do i want to highlight here um yes definitely okay looking at bullet point number four up, oh, let me go back. Bullet point number four, which is synthesize the information in a way to support your own ideas. Sub bullet to that. I'm going to try to highlight and bold this. The opinions of your outside sources should not replace your own opinions. Okay. In other words, you shouldn't use those outside sources to make your point for you. You need to make your own point and have your own um, have your own opinion on a topic or a subtopic. State a fact and then bring in an outside uh, source to back up what you're saying. Okay, don't just in other words, don't just quote from outside sources and use them as your own uh, uh, replacements for your own ideas. Okay. I see that a lot of times in, in papers that students, I can tell that they're not really trying to make a point at all. All they're doing is regurgitating everything that they've read in that source. Okay. They still give credit to the source, but they're not really stating an opinion that is their own. They're just regurgitating what somebody else has written. Okay. If I wanted that, or if other professors wanted that, we would just go read those sources for ourselves. We want to know what you think, okay? What is your opinion? What is the fact that you want to state? And then give me outside sources that kind of back that opinion up, okay? Again, the outside sources that you select can either support or argue against the points that you want to make, and the combination of those two depends on the purpose of your essay, but they should never, ever, ever replace the, your own voice within that essay. Okay. Does that make sense for everybody? I see that so many times. All right. All right. The other thing that you can do to help you, and this is an old school method. Okay. I want to go back to this, example that we use where we listed all these sources out 
on the page. We had like 10 different sources and we grouped them into categories. One of the things that will help you sort and, and categorize your, your sources of data for your paper is the use of note cards. Okay. And again, you can have a different colored note card for every category that you've identified in those pool of sources. Okay. Again, in this example, we identified three. So I could actually use note cards to take notes from each one of these categories and have each category in a different color note card to help me keep, you know, the categories straight. Okay. Again, this is an old school method. A lot of you have probably uh, utilized this before in, in high school and then in some other college courses, but the use of note cards is extremely helpful, especially when you're up late at night and you're tired, you're trying to keep all this stuff straight. Um, utilizing those note cards and using different colored ones to keep all of the categories straight and then take, keep the notes straight that you're taking from each one of those sources is extremely helpful, okay? I see, uh, I, I still see some students in my class from time to time. They're still bringing in those old school note, note cards and uh, using them, you know, to help them conduct research and, and take notes and stuff. Um, definitely get into the habit of doing that. It will help you, all right? Let's see, where is my toolbar up here? There it is. Somebody just tried to message me and I can't figure out where this is going. What is going on here? Ah, there we go. All right, chat. Um, oh, you were trying to figure out what BRB means? Okay, no problem. All right. Be right back. All right. Let me go through here. What are some other things that I want? So again, beware, be wary of false news. Um, make sure that, okay, yeah, we got that. All right, quoting, paraphrasing, and summarizing. Here's another, I'm gonna have examples of this in, in some other uh, documents that I upload for you, okay? You're gonna see some content populate the course materials page in, in Blackbook this weekend to kind of reinforce some of the, our Blackboard, to uh, reinforce some of these things. When you're using outside source data, you can use it in three different ways, okay? The most common that I see is someone direct quoting, okay? In other words, you find a passage in a book or a magazine article or a newspaper article and you go, oh my gosh, I love the way that author said that. I'm just going to take that verbatim pop it into my paper, put quotations around it and directly quote from it, okay? Which is absolutely fine. Again, as I state here, it's a method of integrating an, an author's exact words into the text of your essay, absolutely fine. However, as I've noticed some students do, they get in the habit of, next thing I know, there's a direct quote or two direct quotes every paragraph in the page or every paragraph in the essay. Okay, and that's why I say here, use direct quotes sparingly as possible and only in cases where you cannot paraphrase the text or in other words, rewrite the text better than the original version that the author composed, okay? Again, there's nothing wrong with using a few direct quotes here and there. I prefer or I recommend to students Try to limit your use of direct quotes in every essay to two or, or, or one or two, no more than that, okay? Unless you're writing a paper about Mark Twain who is notorious for quotes, okay? Um, and in that case, that would work probably a lot more, uh, or a lot easier. But for general topics, you really want to limit your use of direct quotes. The preferable option is the second one right here, paraphrasing, which is you're getting the information from the source, okay? So for example, um, one of the books that I identified here in this paper that I'm writing about trying to find the right university for the degree program, one of the books in here, I want to use some information in the body of my essay. So using that note card, 
I've identified that section that I want, but I'm going to rewrite that in my own words. Okay. And I'm going to synthesize it in, in, in a form that reinforces what my thought is. Okay. So in other words, you're only just borrowing the information to back up what you want to say. All right. And like I said, right here, the paraphrased ideas and data still belong to the original source. So just because you reword it in your own words doesn't mean you own it. Okay. That information that you're citing still belongs to the author who published it. Therefore, you have to give them credit immediately after you finish utilizing that information in your paper. Okay. And we'll talk about some general strategies next week. Um, and I'll give you some examples of how to do that. But in a nutshell, it's usually within the paragraph that you're composing that you will give an author credit for the information that you're util, uh, using to present in that paragraph, okay? And again, you can have multiple sources that are referenced um, in that paragraph, okay? So paraphrasing is a way of restating information and data from the source in your own words. The last one is uh, what we call summarizing. You don't see this technique too much anymore, all right? Um, it's a very abstract way of basically quoting from a whole source by really pulling out some, some bottom line information and putting it up front, what we call a bluff. Um, and there's not a lot of detail with it. It's just a generalization. Uh, you don't see that too much anymore summarizing, but I, I threw it in here just for those of you who um, are, want to be a student of literature and research one day. Uh, that form is, is somewhat utilized here and there, but not too much anymore. Uh, down here at the bottom, I, I put a little note in here. The use of signal verbs can alert the reader that an outside source material is being used uh, to support your own ideas and present it in the essay. And I even call out the page number in the textbook, uh, page 537. Again, we'll look at some examples of this next week. Um, but some of the examples here are like um, acknowledges and admits and advises, uh, emphasizes, confirms, contends, responds, suggests, etc. So in other words, if you're quoting from Tolkien in a particular passage in your essay and you say, Tolkien acknowledges that the ring in Lord of the Rings symbolizes blah, 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 blah. Okay. That's a clear indication to the reader that that's not your, th that's not coming from you. That's coming from a source that you're referencing in your research. And then you're just bringing it in to reinforce whatever you want to say. Okay at that moment, that's when you're going to use a citation there to indicate that that information belongs to someone else. But this use of a signal verb also is an indication to the reader that the information contained within that sentence or group of sentences is actually coming from an outside source, not coming from you. Does that make sense? So you would still have to quote the person even though you acknowledge the author? Yeah. Yeah, you would still, you, you wouldn't directly quote them, but you would uh, basically the information that you would writing there acknowledges or uh, confirms or implies everything that follows that statement is basically a paraphrased uh, citation of the original source. In other words, you're rewriting the information contained within that source in your own words. You're just calling it out that it belongs to this author. Okay. Again, we'll look at, we'll look at some examples of this. Uh, if I have time tonight, I'll pull up that original essay uh, about the 1980s and I'll, I'll highlight where a lot of these signal verbs are used. Okay. All right. Great question. Let me see what else I have in here. Uh, and of course, plagiarism. 
I have a whole slide dedicated to plagiarism. Now, uh, sir, plagiarism means to copy without permission, correct? That is absolutely correct. Or to, uh, or to imply that the thoughts and opinions that are contained within a paragraph are your own when they actually belong to someone else. Not necessarily copied, but basically taking ownership of. No, that would be called plagiarism right over there. Oh, yeah. So, excuse me. In this section, I give you some tips on how to avoid plagiarism. Now, I have not, in the time that I have taught here at Northwest Florida State, um, had an incident, thank God, that anybody has intentionally tried to plagiarize another person's work and pass it off as their own. Um, and I think it's because of the story that I told when my previous uh, college, when I actually did catch a student and the manner in which I caught that person uh, has put a, the fear of God in a lot of people. Uh, I'm a very, very good researcher. I've been well-trained in the area of research um, and I can find any source out there. As a student of mine back in 2006 found out, uh, just to give you a little background on it, I gave them an assignment one night and I told them to, to write a poem after we looked at various styles of poetry. I asked them, I want you to go home. And when we meet again next week, I want you to bring a poem that you've composed according to one of the styles that we have uh, uh, reviewed. Okay. So, of course, when we came back the next week, all the students turned in their poems. Well, one of the poems sounded way too good to be true way too good to be true. And so I started doing a little research on it. And I took a couple of lines from the poem and I put them inside of Google. And uh, this is back in Google's early days, but it was still a very effective search engine even back then. Uh, took a couple lines out of that poem from the middle of the poem, popped them into the search engine, started doing a little digging and I came across a website that had those exact lines from the poetry in the website. And so I clicked the link and guess what I found? It was a hallmark.com website. And the student actually copied verbatim from the beginning line to the end line, the entirety of the poem, copied into a Word document, signed her name to it and turned it in. And so what I did was I printed out the reference from hallmark.com, the poem verbatim, the same one that she turned in. And when she, and I, I turned, I gave her her copy of her, um, her poem with a big goose egg on there. And it said, see me after class. Well, of course she came up to me after class and she was like, well, Mr. Davis, why did you give me a zero? I thought the poem was on, was, was great. I thought you would enjoy that. And I said, I did enjoy the poem. I enjoyed it very much. It was an awesome, it was well composed. It was a lovely poem. Well, okay, then why did you give me a zero? So I quietly reached into my bag and I handed her the copy of the hallmark.com website. And I said, this is why. And she immediately started crying. She said, Mr. Davis, this is a coincidence. I swear to God, I did not steal that poem from this website. And I said, well, Miss So-and-so, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I know you did. I have the proof right here. And she said, and she held her hand up like this. Actually, she held up both hands and she did like this. She said, I swear to Jesus above that I compose that poem. And I immediately stopped her and I said, whoa, the last thing you need to do is to swear to Jesus that you're not lying to me right now because there are serious consequences that you could suffer because... I said, just stop. Okay. Just stop. I know what you've done. Okay. Unfortunately, I give you a zero for the, because you've plagiarized another person's work. You tried to pass it off as your own. You won't admit it to me. So unfortunately I've got the proof. I've got your paper. I have to turn them both into the academic um, committee here at the college and it, it's up to them what they do with you. Well, they ended up putting her on, uh, I think two year probation for that. 
they came close to kicking her out of the school because uh, it was late. Sir, what's two year probation? Uh, basically, she was under academic probation for two years. All of her assignments were uh, critiqued by the committee. All of the major papers that had research um, present within the work, every one of them had to be quality checked and verified uh, before you know they were given back to her. Okay. So what does probation mean? Uh, probation means if you do it again, you're kicked out. You're done. Dang. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I'm not aware of what Northwest policies are. Okay. And if you, if you want information on that, I'm sure you can go to the administration. They can give you that. But uh, from what I've, what I have <laughs> Uh, found out is every year in every class that I tell this story to, I never have a problem with anybody trying to plagiarize because I am that damn good at finding borrowed material. I promise you, if you try it, I'll find it. Uh, but there's instances like hers that were blatant. Okay. She knew exactly what she was doing. In the other sense, there's unintentional. In other words, you forgot to directly quote or you forgot to cite where information uh, was borrowed from an outside source. Those are what we call unintended uh, incidences of plagiarism. That is not the same as somebody who blatantly tries off to pass off another person's work as their own, okay? Uh, the use of citations and a work cited page is enough to avoid plagiarism of your paper and to give full and proper credit to authors that you're using the, the information that you're using from other authors in your paper. Okay. So let me, let me kind of relax some, some nerves out there in case anybody's feeling it right now. If, if essay number two, three, and four, if you turn those in with adequate work cited pages, okay and you have cited in the paper using the notation where you have pulled that information from, from that list and that's included in the works cited page, you're not going to be guilty of plagiarism, okay? However, if you forget to, to attach that works cited page or, and or you forget to directly cite within the paper, using the notation of the author's last name and the page number, that is what we call unintended plagiarism, okay? That won't get you a date with the academic committee, but it will get you several points taken off, okay? So in other words, make sure at the very least your work site, if you have a work cited page on there, then you're not guilty of plagiarism in my book. You've, uh, you've given the authors credit. You may have missed citations here and there within the essay where you're utilizing that information, but the works cited page really covers your rear end in that respect, okay? So sources that do need acknowledgement directly, uh, again, are the direct quotes you need. You need an acknowledgement of who that author is that you're directly quoting and an arguable statement or information that may not be common knowledge. Those are instances within the paper that you have to, to cite, okay? So if you're, for example, if you're quoting, um, if you're quoting John Smith, who stated in his source that 52% of the American population never vote in an election, Okay, that's an empirical observation that Mr. Smith uh, discovered in, an, an, in a survey, okay? That information belongs to Mr. Smith. So that information, if you reference that in your paper, that, ha that credit has to be given to Mr. Smith, okay? That's an example of a source of uh, information that has to be cited. You have to give Mr. Smith credit for stating that empirical fact. Sources that do not need acknowledgement are information that most of you are already likely to know, okay? Like when you're driving down the street, 
when you come up to a sign that is colored red and the word stop is listed on it, you must stop, okay? That's an empirical statement there, but that's common knowledge. That's not because somebody wrote about it and was able to discover that in an experiment or the sky being blue on a clear sunny day. That's common knowledge. Nobody can take credit for the fact that, oh, I'm the one that discovered that the sky's blue. I need credit for that, okay? That's common knowledge, all right? Well-known quotations, all right? Like uh, everybody complains about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. That's a well-known quotation. You don't have to give credit for that because it's well-known, all right? Or material that you yourself have created or gathered yourself. In other words, you have interviewed somebody uh, to gather information about the topic you're wanting to write about. You yourself recorded the information. You don't have to cite yourself. Okay. That is data that you have collected and that you are presenting in the essay. All right. No citation needed. Okay. Only information that you have to cite and give proper credit to are, is information coming from a book, a magazine, a newspaper, or a website that was composed by someone else, and the information is not readily known by the public, okay? In other words, it's unique to the observations and the measurements that they are, or he or she observed at the time. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Yes, sir, that does make sense. Okay. So before we go tonight, I'm going to pull up this essay example and please tell me if you can see it. Okay, many of you will probably remember this. This is, this is that wonderful essay that we saw a couple of weeks ago when we first started talking about essay composition and, and thesis statements and uh, source data and stuff, okay? In the body of this essay, or in the introduction, sorry, excuse me, we're gonna start with the introduction. Remember, we had our thesis statement up here. The 1980s brought many things that shaped me and made me the way I am today comma, from the Milwaukee Brewers going to the World Series, uh, the Cabbage Patch Kids craze, and the Challenger explosion, okay? Strong thesis statement, all right? These are all personal to the author. Therefore, no citations necessary because that's information. That's a theory presented by the author, okay? But as we get to the body of the work, you start seeing these little notations pop up right here, right? You see that right there in, in quotations, or not quotations, in parentheses? That is, note, that is documentation notation of information that's coming from an outside source, okay? So let's come up here to the first paragraph, and we're just going to visit this one and kind of illustrate what we're talking about. In the thesis statement, she made the point that one of the things that really stood out in her mind about the 1980s that shaped her was when the Milwaukee Brewers went to the World Series in 1982. She repeats that in, sub, in topic number one. In 1982, the Milwaukee Brewers made it to the biggest ball game. Of yeah, your speaker went out again. Sir, are, are you there? No, mom, they're not gone. Let it catch up. Let it catch up. I'm frozen. Am I back? Yes, you're back, sir. Okay, good. Um, right. Listen, sir, uh, they, they misspelled the uh, Furby by accident. It's supposed to be. Uh, where? Wh who did uh, what? Furby, where, where it says, where it talks about the uh, Cabbage Pats kids craze <laughs> of 1983 okay. being very yeah, similar. Yeah, they did right there. Okay. Furby yeah. of 1988. Yeah. Furby is supposed to be spelled uh, F U R 
B Y, not F I R B Y. I got you. Well, again, you know these these essays, even professionals make mistakes. All right, so let's go back up here to paragraph number two. Okay, paragraph number two starts off with the topic that came from the thesis statement. Remember, Milwaukee Brewers go into the World Series in 1982. The author restates that fact right here in, in the first sentence of paragraph number two. Now, she's going to give you a mix of data and opinions that come not only from her, but from other sources in order to illustrate the point that she's making in the very first sentence of this paragraph. 1982, the Milwaukee Brewers made it to the biggest ball game of the year. The game was the seventh game of the World Series. They were up against the St. Louis Cardinals. According to my dad, quote, everyone who had an interest in sports was either in their houses or at a bar watching a game, including him, Weber J. Okay. So right there, she is directly quoting someone else's thoughts and opinions. Okay using it as an illustrative point to back up her statement in the first sentence of her paragraph. All right. So she gives credit to Weber J. Let's scroll down. Who is Weber J? Well, right here, Weber Jim in a personal interview on the 29th of March, 2002 as cited in her work cited page. So what does that tell me as the reader? This was a personal interview that the author conducted with Mr. Jim Weber. And she recorded the thoughts and opinions of Mr. Jim Weber and used as source data for her paper. Okay. And so going back to the second paragraph, the thoughts and opinions came from her dad, right? But it backed up her thought in the subtopic of the paragraph, okay? So in addition to that, she goes on to say, to make it to the seventh game of the World Series, the Brewers had to beat California Angels in five ball games, okay? That's not her thought and opinion. That's a source that she's pulling to utilize in her essay. And that came from, we go down to the work cited page, that came from the baseball reference. That happens to be a website that was published on the 18th of March, 2002, okay? So right here in the second paragraph, we have a statement that she's making, and then we have a little bit of explanation right? These are also her words, but immediately she starts presenting outside information to back up and, and synthesize with her own thoughts and opinions, okay? And we have two different sources here, Weber J, which happens to be her dad, and also from a baseball website that offers information to back up and relate to the overall paragraph, okay? So you see how that works? When we say synthesizing the data, synthesizing the pool of information and utilizing it in the body of your paper to back up thoughts and opinions that you have presented at the beginning of the paragraph or the section, and you've got a whole bunch of data from outside sources that are backing that up, okay? All right, so, I think I'm going to adjourn for the night because I've talked about a lot. I've thrown a lot at you all. All right. A lot. And just to quickly review, we, we basically, the topic of the night was about the research process. We talked about identifying a topic. We've talked about finding sources of information about that topic. We've talked about evaluating the sources for data integrity and validity. And we've talked about synthesizing those topics and identifying categories that we could use as subtopics within the body of our paper to strengthen it, to reinforce it, and to further refine the thesis statement that we want to write about. 
And at the same time, we talked about documentation methods, namely citations within the MLA standard to indicate and separate our own thoughts and opinions from the thoughts and opinions and data that other people have written about as referenced in the sources that we're using, okay? That's the basic premise behind uh, documentation citations. It's just a notation that that information is not coming from you, it's coming from someone else and you're giving them proper credit, okay? In a nutshell, that's all that citation means. And that citation references the work cited page on the last page of your essay to give the reader an idea of what type of source it is. And if they wanna go look that source up to do some more research, then they have access to it, okay? All right. So we've talked about the MLA process extensively. We talked about how it's formatted, how it should be um, um, formatted as far as the Word document, how it should be formatted and laid out on the page, how it's outlined, how it's not only presenting your own thesis statement and your own thoughts and opinions, but how it utilizes outside sources to, to complement that. And then how to document each and every source type so that we give proper credit. I think we've done a pretty good job over the past few weeks showing you the process of creating an MLA style paper conducting the research in order to, to present that data in a logical format, also to give that, those authors credit for the information that you're borrowing, and, um, and then, you know, wrapping up the final product, okay? Now, and then we've got several examples on the blackboard to kind of illustrate all of these points to you, okay? I've got blackboard, uh, course materials in there in the form of PowerPoints, examples of MLA pay, uh, essays and works cited pages. Um, this weekend, what I will do to help reinforce it some more, I'm going to I'm going to activate the MLA quiz. Okay, I know I've had several people asking, well, when's this quiz coming? Well, it's coming. It's coming this weekend. Okay, this quiz will be ten different questions to ask you. Uh, how you would cite certain sources, how it should look, and I'll even give you page numbers within the, in the textbook where you can find that information, okay? The goal of the quiz is not to trick you and make you look foolish, but it's to, sh to show you how to find information in the textbook in order to come back and give me the right answer, okay? At the same time, it, it kind of reinforces some of these concepts that we've learned about the MLA documentation process, okay? So be on the lookout for that this weekend, the MLA quiz. All right, next week, we will talk about literacy narratives, okay? Uh, just a form of an academic paper that's using MLA standards to, um, and just in a different form. And we'll talk about the methods that, um, are utilized in composing that type of a narrative, okay? Which will be which will be used to help you in uh, or to compose your uh, requirement for essay number two. All right, we'll talk about that next week. So, to wrap it up. Be on the lookout this weekend for the MLA quiz that will fire this weekend. Uh, again, it's not to trip you up; it's to reinforce. If you have any questions about the MLA process about the research process, about the documentation methods. Again, I've got a lot of material on the course content page and Blackboard. However, that may not be so self-apparent or apparent that, that you can pick up on it. If you have any questions, please reach out to me in, the, um, uh, in email and let me know what you're having trouble with. Also, if you have questions about sources that you wanna use for essay number two, whether it's valid, whether it, it, it's related to the topic you wanna to write about, uh, send me those sources. I'll check them out and I'll help, you, I'll help you in the evaluation stage, okay? All right, before I close tonight, does anybody have anything they'd like to, to say? Any, anybody got any questions? I do. Yes, ma'am. 
Um, I know that I have midterms for my other classes. Does this have a midterm? Is that what that quiz is or? No, there is no, I do not give midterm. Okay, that's what I was looking at the syllabus. I didn't see anything on there about midterm or anything. I, for an English class, uh, one that's writing based, I don't believe in midterms. Uh, okay. To me, it's it's about the writing process and, and refining it from, from A to B or from A to Z. Um, midterm is not going to help in that respect. So um, now what I will do, what I have to do is I have to give you a midterm grade. Right. Um, and what I'll do is I'll take all of the assignments that you've submitted so far and average them and, and you'll get your midterm grade whenever that's due. But okay. no, no evaluation for that. No, ma'am. Okay, perfect. Cool. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I didn't like those as a student and I damn sure don't like them as a teacher. So until they force me to do midterm exams, I'm not going to do them. Right. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> no All right. Cool. That's right. All right. Anybody else have anything? All right. So as soon as the video has processed for tonight's lecture, I will link it. Um, First of all, I'm going to save it in case nobody's able to see it, but I will link it and send it to you in an email, okay? And just be mindful. It's only active for a few days. For some reason, it, it deletes after two or three days. Uh, I think like day three or day four. So if you need to, uh, to view this again or download it on your own, you're welcome to do that. Make sure you do it Friday or Saturday because after that, it, it, it disappears, okay? All right, anybody else got anything? Everybody good? Give me a thumbs up if you're good. For those of you who haven't fallen asleep yet. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, if nobody has anything, have a great weekend. Wonder it's gonna be absolutely beautiful out there. So go outside, get outside, enjoy the weather. Uh, it's going to be wonderful, and I'll see you all next week, okay? All right. Bye. All right. Thank you all.